First Peter chapter four. First Peter, Peter chapter four. I had a pastor friend ask me today or, or this week, once I shared with him that uh, two families are leaving our church in two weeks, was I discouraged? I said, well, in a sense I am a little bit, I'm not really discouraged um, as much as I am hopeful for how God will use them as they leave here. And he shared something with me that somebody else shared with me some time ago. And I think it's good for us as a church to remember this. It's not about the church's seating capacity. The mission of the church is not how many people can you get in the door. But it's about the sending capacity. Sending people out for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And so as I think about Eli and Kelly as they are going to the western, western far part of the United States, Washington State, preach and proclaim the gospel there. And as the Richardsons are going to the eastern side of Tennessee to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, our prayers ought to be that God would raise up people in our congregation to send them forth for the sake of the gospel. So grateful and, and privileged. 1 Peter chapter 4, and I want to begin reading in verse 1. Therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, and so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you, but they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that those that though judged in the flesh the way people are, that they may live in the spirit the way God does. Verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be, so, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. 
For the last couple of weeks, we have been looking at a sermon of series entitled The Whole Life Christian Steward, or Whole Life Christian Stewardship. This week, we want to look at what it means to be a faithful steward of the gifts of grace that God has entrusted to you and I as believers. A couple of things I put in the outline there again in the bulletin of the thesis and and kind of the main thought throughout this whole sermon series of what it means to be a steward. What it means just simply as a steward is, is a manager, somebody who has been trusted to something. But I wrote maybe more of a complex sentence that would give us some some thoughts for the next few weeks on stewardship. And just simply is that as Christians, we have the responsibility and opportunity to faithfully and energetically manage that which our Master has entrusted to us in every aspect of our lives while we wait upon His return in these last days for His glory. This is what it means to be a steward. This is what it means to be a manager. And we set the sermon series on four premises, four things that we need to remember as we talk about stewardship. Number one is that God owns everything. God owns everything. Psalm 24, 1 tells us the whole earth is His and the fullness thereof. Not only is the earth in the universe, but everything that's in or on the earth and in the universe belongs to God. The second premise we saw uh, as it relates to biblical stewardship, you and I have no rights. You and I have no rights and we have no claims. Now that's a, it's kind of flares us up sometimes as good Americans because we are democratic. We think we have rights. We think that we have a claim. We think that we have a, a say. Maybe on this earth, but not in the realm of the spiritual things. God is sovereign. God rules. And number three, finally, God has the final say. He is the one with the final say. He's the one who rules. He is the one who reigns. And number four, the fourth premise of these series of sermons, is that you and I will give an account for everything that we have been entrusted with. Number four scares me. It puts a, it puts a godly fear in me as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a Christian, God one day will demand you and I to give an account for everything that he has entrusted to us. Our time, our talents, our gifts, our resources, they are God's gifts to us. And as we come to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through through 19 we're going to deal specifically with 7 through 11 the reason why i read the whole chapter is because you need to keep in mind what's going on here as peter writes peter is writing to a group of god's people who are under heavy persecution they are scattered about if you look at first peter chapter 1 in the first verses peter says this is who i'm writing to i'm writing to god's elect who is scattered abroad all over the different regions of asia and different areas of uh, of regions and i'm writing to you to encourage you and he writes to them and the reason why i, I read verses 1 through 19 Yeah, verses 1 through 19, because verses 1 through 6 kind of gives us the backdrop of what's happening. Peter is reminding them that the gospel was preached also not only to the living, but also to the dead. And he's speaking dead spiritually, that they may live or they may come to hope in Christ. But also he talks about at the end uh, of the trials and the persecutions for Christians. And sandwiched in between judgment and... And persecution, he is reminding these believers who are under deep persecution for their faith how to live as they wait upon the return of Christ. If you have not noticed yet, but Matthew 25, Jesus was teaching us something in the parable of the talents. He is teaching his disciples, this is how you are to live and manage what I've entrusted to you until I return. And if you remember last week in Romans 13, Paul reminds the believers in Rome the same thing. To use your time wisely as you are waiting upon Christ's return. Well, this morning, Peter also reminds the believers here that's been scattered around and about to use your gifts 
that God has entrusted to you for the glory of God in and through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to submit to you this morning, there are a lot of people and a lot of Christians who waste a lot of God's time trying to figure out what their spiritual gifts are. Well, Brother Chow, I don't know what to do because I don't know what my gifts are. This morning, I'm going to show you through the passage of Scripture, stop trying to find your spiritual gifts, okay? God already said, for every believer, there are five gifts of His grace that He has entrusted to you. And it's in the text this morning. We're going to look at it, and you're going to say, oh, well, that's so simple. So, maybe I have one. No, you have all five of these. These are gifts of God's grace that he has given to you as a Christian. If you're a Christian here today, you have all these. And I don't want us to spend any more time or, you know, a lot of churches, they give these spiritual tests and it's like 17 pages of questions. Well, do you do this? Do you do that? Oh, and if you rank 1 through 10 here, then you're, listen, forget that. I want to share with you this morning these five gifts of God's grace that he has given to every believer. And number one, it's the gift of prayer. Notice with me, if you will, in the very first verse, verse 7. Notice what Peter reminds these believers. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. I want to note this real quick, verse 7. Notice what he tells these believers. The end of all things is at hand. Peter is reminding these Christians who are going through persecution 2,000 years ago, the end is at hand. What you're experiencing is real tribulation. Listen, we don't have to wait for this quote-unquote great tribulation to take place as some people would believe over in Revelation. The persecution has been upon the church since the very instance in Acts chapter 2. The church has been under persecution since 2,000 years ago. And Peter is reminding them the end is at hand. Remember this. What does this mean to know that the end is at hand? This is what Peter is saying. You need to be intentional and you need to be urgent about how you live your life as you wait upon Christ's return. What Peter is reminding them that Christ could return at any moment. It does matter how we live our lives. It does matter what type of example we set forth for others who are around us. It does matter that we are being uh, urgent and intentional with preaching and sharing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because at any moment, Christ could return. Do you believe that today? Or do you believe that all these other things has to happen before Christ? Listen, I believe at this very moment that Christ can return, and that's the end. That's the end. Then the judgment. And if you're not saved here today, you need to repent right now. You need to believe upon Christ right now, for He could come right now and split the eastern sky apart and lift His church out of here. And guess what happens? If you're not saved, judgment. The wrath of God, the judgment of God. So there's an urgency that Peter is writing to these believers. of Their day-to-day life. And sisters, I grew up, my grandmother, uh, my great grandmother, I, I remember her even talking about Jesus. She would look at the things that was happening in the early 80s and she'd say, Oh Lord, come quickly. I just wonder if my old mama was still living today, what she would say. We have heard that the Lord is coming. We have heard the Lord is coming. And many scoff and laugh, but brothers and sisters, the day is at hand now. Think about what Christ says. The very first words He says in His earthly ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We have to live with urgency. And this urgency, notice in our text in verse 7, calls us to be self-controlled, sober-minded. In other words, it does matter how we live our lives. As believers, the reason why we are to live this way, he says, is that our prayers, for the sake of our prayers. Now, that's very interesting, isn't it? Because earlier in 1 Peter 3, he also says husbands to love their wives in a certain way because if you don't love your wives in a certain way, God won't hear your prayers. Your prayers will be hindered. 
very, very odd there to think that our prayers could be hindered because of the way in our attitudes and our actions toward our lives and toward God. He says to be sober-minded and to be self-controlled. Do you ever find it difficult to pray? Do you ever do you ever feel like sometimes your prayers doesn't make it through the ceiling? Have you ever prayed and it's just like a bounce right off the ceiling back down? It's just like there's no power, there's no answer, there's no Let me ask you, do you get discouraged sometimes and just quit praying altogether? <laughs> what what for? Have you ever thought that maybe our prayer life has some kind of tie to our to our the way that we live how we are we self-controlled are we sober-minded are we keeping our minds on the things of God do we exercise this gift of prayer that God has entrusted to us J.C. Ryle said this about prayer he says what is the reason that some believers are so much brighter and holier than others he says, I believe the difference in 19 cases out of 20 arises from different habit, habits about our private prayer. I believe that those who are eminent, eminently holy pray little, and those who are eminently holy pray much. Brothers and sisters, God has entrusted to you as a believer and to me as a Christian the gift of prayer. It is our responsibility to, to engage to exercise with faith, believing what we pray. Listen, we don't have to take a spiritual test here. Paul, or, or Peter, has already told us this is a gift of God's grace to you as a believer that you can commune with the holy God through prayer. The question is, do you and I take advantage of that? Do we exercise that? Do we believe in what we pray when we pray? I was thinking this week, what is it that causes Christians to fail in exercising these gifts of grace? I believe one reason why many Christians fail to pray is because they never plan to pray. Sometimes it's good to have a plan. This is when I'm going to meet with the Lord. This is when I'm going to pray. Sometimes Christians have never been taught to pray. We talked about this some weeks ago on Wednesday night. What did the G disciples asked Jesus Lord teach us to pray and third of all a lot of times Christians just fail to pray because they don't believe that God will answer their prayers what do we believe are you exercising this gift of grace of prayer notice second of all in verse 8 another gift that you have been entrusted with is love notice what he says above all keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. I don't know about you, but if I'm in the early church here being scattered, persecuted, and I've seen my mother beheaded and hung upside down, dipped in oil, burned at the stake, I don't know, but I'm going to need a group of people to love me because of my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to need somebody to wrap their arms around me and speak the truth in me. And Peter reminds them that above all things that believers can do, above everything, all your good works, all your good deeds, anything else, the most important thing that a believer can do or that a church can do is wrap their arms around persecuted brothers and sisters and love them. To love them. Notice what he says. To love one another. Now, let me ask you this. People who stay at home and watch television, and that's their church, and they're able to come to church and be involved in a local uh, so, uh, assembly of believers, how can they love one another separated from a congregated group of believers? You can't do it. I tell a lady that I know personally, who I love dearly, she says, I can worship right here. Yeah, true. But you cannot fulfill the commands of God when you forsake one another, when you not pray for one another, when you're not loving one another. You can't do that apart from the local assembly of gathered believers. And Peter reminds these believers, these persecuted believers, above anything else that you do, love one another. Why is love so important? Now I want you to know this too, this is not some feel-good love, warm, fuzzy kind of love. That's an emotion. This is not phileo, brotherly love. This is agape love. 
This is the love that loves even if you don't love me. This is the type of love that regardless, I'm going to go out of my way for you because I agape you. It's the selfless type of love. It's the sacrificial type of love. It's the love that will keep giving even if you don't give anything to me. It is so opposite of our natural understanding of what love is in our culture today. Why is that? Because I love banana pudding. Is that the same love that Peter's speaking about? Absolutely no. He says this type of love will do what? Notice in verse 8. What will this type of love do? What will this agape love do? It will cover a multitude of sins. Isn't that good? That tells me that regardless of what is taking place in the church, regardless if a brother or sister sins against me, Regardless if I like this person or if I don't like this person, I am commanded by God through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to love one another. And in this instance, I can love them even if they sin against me because love covers a multitude of sins. Has any of you been wronged before? Have you ever been wronged in the church? It doesn't feel real good, does it? But guess what God tells us? Are you to hate that person? Are you to downgrade that person? Are you to run them down to others? No, he says he's given you a gift of grace. He says love covers a multitude of sin. Is it easy? You can't do this on your own. That's the reason why, first of all, you've got to be saved. You've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to bow down and and bow your knee and and put your lips to the dirt of the earth and say, God, you're going to have to give me the grace to love this person who has sinned against me. But love covers a multitude of sins. How can I love that person? How can I truly forgive that person? Because God, I deserve hell. That's why. And you forgave me of my sins. Therefore, I can love and I can forgive others who have sinned against me because I am nobody special. I deserve your wrath. I deserve your judgment. I deserve hell. But in your mercy and your love, in your love, God, you love me so much that you sent your only begotten Son. It's the same two Greek words, love, agape, selfless, sacri- unsacrificial, or sacrificial love. Because I have been saved, therefore, and I've been forgiven much, I can forgive much. A person who hasn't experienced forgiveness will never forgive anybody else. A person who has not experienced the agape love of God through Christ will never express that agape love to another person. So see, it all goes back to, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Well, Brother Chad, you don't know what they did to me. It doesn't matter. He says that we have been given the gift of grace. And if you have been forgiven much, you too can forgive much by loving and, and by the multitude of sin. It, it covers that. Think about what Romans 5, 8 says. That God demonstrated his love toward us. That because I'm a good person, God sent Jesus to die for sinners. Absolutely not. He said, God demonstrated his love toward us that while yet we were sinners, God sent his son who loved us and redeemed. That's the good news of the gospel. It's not that we're good people, but we have a good God who loves us. And he has given that to us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 and 2. He says that, therefore being justified, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts as believers. The love of God has been shed in our hearts. Therefore, we can love one another. God has given us that gift of grace to love. But notice also in verse 9, the third gift of grace that God has given to us to be stewards of. He tells them, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. God has entrusted you, yes, you, the gift of hospitality. Oh, no, Brother Chad, I, I the gift of hospitality yes here again if you're being persecuted as a christian where would you like to gather at remember they didn't have a pleasant hill baptist church house to go meet to meet in guess where they would have worship services at in homes 
And guess where the traveling apostles and, and preachers, would, evangelists of this day, would stay at? They didn't stay at the comfort suite at the interstate. They stayed in home. Some of you remember when the preacher would come and have two-week services. The preacher would move from house to house and stay with the preacher or with those families. One of the reasons why, because the inns w- wasn't very uh, safe and nor were they very comfortable. But guess where a good place would be at if you're a persecuted preacher or Christians being persecuted for your faith? To, to be at home or stay at the home of other believers. It's hospitality. It's the gift that God has given every believer to share with other brothers and sisters of the faith. Listen, I want to stay with other Christians. I want to be in fellowship. I want to be served by by other brothers and sisters in Christ. I don't want to have to wonder if I'm going to be safe sleeping under this tree or sleeping under this porch. I, I, I want to be with brothers and sisters that we can gather, commune, and worship together in our homes. The gift of God's grace that he has given to believers is that of hospitality. Now let me ask you this question. What what we think of hospitality in America today is we think entertainment. There is a distinct difference between hospitality and entertainment. Entertainment. Everything has to be perfect. Before I can have anybody over in my home, I've got to wash the walls, baseboards, wash my windows. I've got to make sure the lawn is just, everything's perfect. I've got to have a nine-course meal so when the families come over, I want everything to be everything perfect here. And I'm just running here, running there. And you know what? The difference between entertainment and hospitality is, hospitality says, yeah, I picked up a little bit and we got some hot dogs. You know, we want you to come over and fellowship with us. Entertainment disregards the gospel and also investing in those people's lives while you're running around trying to make sure all the food's ready. Hospitality, you say, you know what, we don't have much, but we're going to have some pimento cheese sandwiches and potato chips, but we want to talk. What about you? How are you doing with the Lord? Tell me something about yourself. Where did you grow up at? Who, who raised you? What did you do? Where did you work at? Where did you live? Hospitality says, regardless of what my home looks like, I want brothers and sisters to come in my home so I can pour my life and serve them. The difference between hospitality and entertainment. The American church today says we can't have people in our home because, you know, that's what we go to church for. And by God's grace, we have grown out of that here, I believe. There's a lot of hospitality and a lot of fellowship and a lot of servant gospel conversations that take place in homes and having prayer meetings in homes and and things of that nature, which is really awesome. I believe there's some good things there that takes place. But I want to challenge you with something. Not, Not only does he commend the church here to practice hospitality and you have been commanded you do this with one another but you do it without grumbling Uh, hospitality is spoken quite a bit about matter of fact in first timothy 3 it's so important that that the holy spirit says in order to be an elder in the church you have to be able to practice this you you are to practice this widows are to practice hospitality in first timothy as well first timothy 5 and verse 10 I want to challenge you with something this morning. Answer this question. When's the last time you had somebody in your home for a meal and got to know them? Now, let's not think out of the box. Let's just think in the box right now. When's the last time you have somebody from, your, from our church family over for a meal? Okay, you just answer that question in your mind. And it's not for the sake of entertainment, but it's for the sake of serving them, how to pray for them, how to minister to them. Sharp iron sharpens iron. So here's a challenge. This month is almost over. Next month is coming. Busy time of the year. I want to challenge you between next month and the new year, have somebody over in your home to serve them and to show hospitality. Okay? Give you the end of January. Can you do that? And I want you to do this. I want somebody who is not like you. What does that mean? That means senior adults. We got young families here. 
in our church. Ask them over. Or vice versa, young adults, ask the senior adults. Okay, and then we're going to get real radical after the first of the year. Then I'm going to have you to practice hospitality by bringing a lost family in your home that you know that you work with, a friend or a neighbor, to just have a meal with them. Listen, God has not entrusted you to a home and the resources for it to be a center of refuge, but it is a center of hospitality. And what we do in our homes is that we, re- we, we recess to that and we feel safe in our homes, right? And so when people come in our home, we feel a little bit of, little bit of remember, whose home is that? God's. God owns everything. We have no right, and we will give an account for that. Peter says every believer has this gift of grace called hospitality. Notice, fourth of all, he says in verse 10, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace. It's the gift of service. God has entrusted to you, and if you look that word up, service, it's the the Greek word diakonos, which means to serve. That's what deacons are. They're servants of the church. But he is speaking to all the church here, to all the believers here, that they are to serve. They are to expend themselves. They are to faithfully and energetically to serve and pour themselves out, not for themselves, but for who? Notice who Peter says to serve in verse 10 one another here again you can't do that apart from the local congregation you can't do that apart from a local church and if you go to romans 12 and first corinthians 12 you see there's a a list of gifts that paul speaks of that every member of the body of christ has some has the gift of prophesying some has a gift of serving some has a gift of teaching encouraging giving governing or just the gift of mercy But there are spiritual gifts that are listed. And yes, every believer has one. And yes, you have this gift as well to serve the body of Christ. There is a big misunderstanding in churches today. Here's how this misunderstanding goes. Preacher, you prophesy, you teach, you evangelize, you this, you that. You this, you that. You have all the spiritual gifts. Plus, we pay you. This is what you do. Uh, Wrong answer. Do you know what really the job of the pastor is to do and the pastors? To build up the saints to do the work of the ministry. The pastor's responsibility, the main role of the pastors of the church is to build up to teach the word of God to encourage the saints of God to use the gift of God grace that God has given you to practice hospitality to pray to love to use the gifts that God has given you the gifts of service in serving one another and I've heard it time and time and time again I've I came from a church that that was their mindset was that the preacher should be at every function all the time regardless of whatever and I believe that the pastor should lead by example but if a pastor's son has a baseball game I believe it is much his ministry to be at the baseball game as it would be at, at visitation but God has given you gifts to use and to serve one another Now let me stop and say this, because I don't want you leaving here saying, well, my goodness, boy, he just really got all over us. You at Pleasant Hill Baptist Church are extraordinary at doing this. If it is all possible, I have seen this last week, the outpouring of God's people giving and serving and praying and loving And it's no small thing, brothers and sisters. You think bringing a basket of ham sandwiches to somebody's home while they're moving is a small thing? Absolutely not. But we think this way. Well, what Brother Chad does preaching is much more important than bringing ham sandwiches. No, it's not. It's all ministry gifts that God gives us. Listen, it's hard for me to make a ham sandwich. Ask my wife. I don't have that gift. But I can when I get real hungry. Some of you men give up time 
to be at Eli's Thursday. Some of you other men wasn't able to. You were working, and, I, and that's understandable. You pray. Some of you men went Tuesday to hand out food to the homeless people, and you served in that way, and, and women as well. We, we have to get out of this mindset that one job is more important than the other. Read 1 Corinthians 12. What does it say? The ear doesn't say to the eye, I have no use to you. Every member of the body of Christ is as equally important as the other. And I'll go further to say this, that the weakest member of the church, uh, uh, the church will never be any stronger than the weakest member of the church as well. So with that say, how are you doing? What type of member are you when it comes to serving in the body of Christ? Last of all, he says in verse 11, the middle part. He says, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. As Christians, God has entrusted us not only prayer, not only love and hospitality and service, but he's entrusted to us the oracles of God. Or simply put, the word of God. Or let's break it down a little bit more, the gospel. Every Christian here has been gifted the grace of prayer, the grace of agape love, the grace of hospitality, the, the grace of service, and God has graced you with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Five things. You don't have to take a test or anything. If you're being persecuted for your faith because of the gospel, you are willing to die for the gospel. See, we don't think like that here. If you're willing to die for the gospel, and Peter can write this because why? Peter died for the gospel. He said, matter of fact, I'm unworthy to die as my Savior. Hang me upside down and crucify me like that. If you're wor willing to die, what better thing will, will console you? What is it that's going to build you up? What is it that's going to give you hope as a Christian being persecuted in the last days. It's the very thing that you are willing to die for, the gospel, the oracles of God. If you're going to profess to be a Christian, you're going to have to die for the gospel. We, we're going to have to die to ourselves, not literally maybe hanging upside down, but it's the gift of the gospel that will console us as we are persecuted, as they was persecuted. Think about it. What is it that's going to console a, a young mother who's lost a child at birth? What about the spouse who loses a husband or a wife? What about the, the man who went to work on Monday and they give him a, a red card, a blank slip or whatever they do these days and says, you know what, we don't need you anymore. You're fired. You lost your job. We're laying you off. What's going to console that, those people? Well, just toughen up. Do better. Pull yourself up by the proverbial bootstraps. Peel a layer of onion off your life. What about the homeless people down under Union Street Bridge? Man, why, why are you here? Can you not go get you a job and do better than this? Do better for yourself. Straighten up, man. Let me tell you, the only hope that any of those have in any situation is going to be the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why is it so important to speak, as Peter says, the oracles of God? Because it's the only thing that will give us hope. I can come in there and say, hey, buddy, tough loss. Sorry for you. You know what? Our human words mean really nothing to people sometimes. Dr. John Killian in our pastoral ministry class, he told us, he said, pastors, one day you're going to be at the bedside of a saint who died unexpectedly or a family. You're going to be at the hospital when a family gives, a, a woman gives birth to a child who is stillborn. 
there are going to be times in your ministry that you're going to be at a car scene where the person passed away and you have to minister to that family in your church. What are you going to say? And everybody started popping. Well, I, I'll quote John 3.16. I'll quote Psalm 121. He says, no, that's your problem now. You preachers talk too much. He said, you need to practice the ministry of presence. Be there for them. But here, he says, to a prerequisite of just being there is that they need to know that you are willing to preach them the gospel because that's the only hope that they have, is the gospel. And we as believers need to be reminded of that. And me as a pastor has to be reminded and the other brothers and sisters who teach here of the gospel because you don't preach to people when they are suffering the gospel as it was. You preach it to them now. You preach it to them Sunday and Monday and you remind them of the gospel because there's always going to be a time in our lives where it's going to hit us like a ton of bricks and we're going to have to be reminded of Jesus' love for us and that we've been forgiven and we're, without, we're not without hope. Remember what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I received. Notice the words that Paul says, I delivered to you that which I received. You can't deliver something unless you've received it. And what we need to be reminded that God has granted us, by His grace, the gospel. Did you know that there are multitudes who die every day without hearing the gospel? Do you know that there are some of us here today who have heard the gospel over and over and over and over again? And we have come to a place in our lives that we have hardened our hearts so much against God that the gospel has no effect in our lives anymore. We are blessed. We are blessed to have the gospel. And if you have received the gospel, you and I have responsibility to deliver the gospel. The oracles of God. This is a gift of God's grace. So as we close this morning, I want you to take away a few things from this sermon. Guess what Thursday is? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Most people will be with friends and family. And you will eat and you will eat and you will eat and watch football and do this and do that. And you'll eat and eat and eat and eat. And you'll <gasps> unbutton your pants and eat and eat and <laughs> You're going to be around family members and friends not only this week, but guess what comes in December? Christmas, holiday season. You're going to be around lost people that's going to need to know the gospel. And guess what? We've seen that God has gifted you to do that, right? Amen? He has gifted you with prayer. He's gifted you with love. He's gifted you with hospitality. He's gifted you with service. He's gifted you with the gospel, the oracles of God. So somewhere along the next month, let's take out a little bit of time to speak the oracles of God into the lives of our family members. Even if you say, well, Brother Chad, all my family's saved. Praise God. Share, you ought to be talking about the gospel quite a bit then. But if you're like me, you're going to be around family members who don't know the gospel and who's not trusted in Christ. And this is a great opportunity for us to be stewards of the gospel. And keep this in mind, we will give an account to God. So use what God has given you. Make it a point to practice these gifts of grace that God has entrusted to you. Be found faithful. Brother Chad, I'll make a mess of it. Guess what? If God can speak through a jackass in, first, in the Old Testament, He can make the rocks cry out, He can use you and me. Amen? To His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, for Your love, Your mercy, and Your grace. <clears throat> God, thank You for the gifts of grace that You have given us as believers. We don't have to take spiritual tests. We just look in your word, obey the commands that you have entrusted to us. And Lord, by your grace and by your spirit, practice what you have given us. 
Thank you for the good gifts of grace. Thank you for salvation in Christ and that you put a, a desire in us to do these things. God, it's not a burden, but it's a joy to share the gospel. It's a joy to love one another. It's a joy to, to pray with one another. It's a joy to show hospitality to one another and to serve one another. Praise God for the church and praise God for the one another's that you have entrusted to us, even in our congregation here at Pleasant Hill. Father, and for the person here today who has none of these desires, oh God, change their hearts. Break them. Convict them. Show them that you have created them for your glory and that through Christ they can know you and that you would place this new desires in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.